Okay, so we are recording now. So welcome everyone. We're, so we're doing bold leads tonight. Um, I have uh, a couple, I'm gonna go over the agenda very briefly and then we'll go right into it, okay? So um, what we're gonna do tonight um, <clears throat> is I'm gonna do some announcements, which this that's what this is. Um, and right after the announcements, I'm gonna do a very quick review of um, bold taxonomy, just the very basics of the, so we're all on the same page. So we know what we're talking about. And then we're gonna open up the sharing um, and at the suggestion of another um, NJMA member, um, excuse me, one, one second. Sorry, I'm still admitting, I have to admit people into the waiting room. So doing two things at once. Okay, at the suggestion of another member, um, we're gonna try opening this up in the beginning to beginners, right? To try to let the beginners get a chance to show their stuff off first. Okay, um, I'm gonna try to split it like in between, like probably like 45 minutes. After about 45 minutes of that, by 8.15, I'm gonna cut it off. Okay, because I do have observations from six or seven people that they've already sent me. Um, that would be like Dave, Liz, Dorothy, myself, John and Nina, Sue and Maricel. Um, we'll go through them. So those are ones that we already have identified or close to identified. Okay, um, so I'm going to, Start. And I think what we wanted to do is when we're doing that, where we're sharing, especially when the, the beginners are sharing your stuff, and I'm using beginners loosely, you can judge for yourself whether you're a beginner or not. Um, I'm not going to judge anyone as a beginner or not myself. Um, but when we are, those people are sharing their stuff, it would be nice if we just not shout out the names, but let them have an opportunity to tell us what the identification is. And if they don't have the ID, they can just say they don't know what it is, and then it can be a, we can all try to jump the gun and be the first one to identify it. But um, it would be nice if we let them try to explain what they're looking at since this is like a study session. We're supposed to be trying to, you know, work through some of this stuff. All right. So all that, I'm going to share my screen. And can you guys see the schedule here? You guys can see that? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so um, this is the rest of the announcements. I don't know if you guys saw the schedule. It was tacked into the bottom of the email for the Taxonomy Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> the schedule of what we're um, for the rest of the for the rest of the winter per se. So tonight are, are bull eats. Next week, um, member finds for the month of January. So we want to look at stuff that we have found over the month of January. So winter taxonomy, so stuff that we have found in the cold weather. Um, the first week of February, crust and resupinates. This is following Alden Dirk's crust lecture. Then we're gonna do chanterelles, trumpets and friends. Some kind of edible thing, because we're probably gonna miss mycophagy this year. Not probably, we are. Uh, there's not gonna be a mycophagy session this year. So we're gonna do some kind of edible thing around that time, polypores. And then we're gonna do, um, members finds for the month of February, see if anybody's finding anything out there at that point. Then we'll do an intro to ASCOs, um, everything but morels. Then the following week, we'll do ASCOs part two, like the morels and the friends, because probably pretty soon after that, people will start finding some morels within the next few weeks after that, a month or so, something like that. Okay, um, March 23rd, the spring mushrooms, basidios. Then the members finds for the month, month of March, and then the first two weeks of April, some kind of introductory to field ID and a keys workshop. So that's what the schedule is looking like for the rest of the uh, this mushrooming uh, winter. All right. And <coughs> there we go. Okay. And then I did want to share with you guys the uh, lecture schedule because we've been adding stuff to this. Stuff has been add being added on a regular basis to this lecture schedule. So this Sunday, Karen Hughes, fungi associated with burns. Um, then next Friday, Alden Dirks, the ecology of crust fungi. Um, the following Friday, Judy Jacobs, marble monuments, lichens and biofilms. Uh, two Fridays after that, Tom Horton, the role of swilloid fungi in conifer establishment. Okay, so another bullet thing going on there. Friday, February 26, Patty, um, I think I misspelled her name here. I think it's Karish, uh, or maybe I didn't, Kaishin. I'm not sure, I might have misspelled her name. The Science Underground, Quip Mycology as a Queer Discipline. Okay, um, Friday, March 5th, um, Joe Shenwer, 
on log identification. Saturday, March 20th in the morning, Eugenia Boone, the kitchen mycologist. And finally, Friday, April 16th, Roy Holling on Australian Belites. So a lot of Belite stuff going on for all you uh, Belite files. Okay, so here we go. This is, there we go. My computer is going slow, toggling slowly. So anyway, as I said, I wanted to just very briefly get everyone on the same page here and make sure we're all talking about the same thing tonight with Belites. Um, so the classic Belite concept, right? This guy here, this is a Belitis edulis. This is a drawing from about a hundred years ago um, by somebody named uh, Jackson. I don't know the, more about the artist than that, except that I have a, came out of a book I have called uh, Mr. Jackson's Mushrooms. But so when we're talking about Belites, we're really talking about these generally fleshy fungi, right? Usually they're fleshy. Usually they're cushion shaped and there's always gonna be an exception here. So we don't need to jump in here and point out the exception to every one of these concepts here, but um, just know that, that there always is some kind of exception to these rules, right? Um, they generally have a fertile surface that's consisting of vertical tubes creating these pores. So that's what this illustration is trying to exhibit. So these little holes here, these are the pores. These are the tubes here. This is a cross section of this mushroom. Um, it was cut in half. What we're looking at here, the fertile surface are thousands, tens of thousands of these little tiny tubes that are packed tightly against each other. And at the bottom of them, these pores, it's as if you're looking up into a tube, into a pipe, and that's where the spores are coming out of, okay? They're generally always on stalks, right? Um, mostly mycorrhizal fungi. That means we're generally finding these on the ground in associations with trees and shrubs. Of course, we know that there's a couple out there that may be parasitizing things, or there may be a couple of saprobes out there, but mostly we are finding these on the ground. And um, according to, um, um, I'm sorry, it's blanking on me, the website that I used for this, um, there's about 92 genera in the family Bulletaceae now, about, this is a worldwide number. Um, so that, that's a website that I use, at, um, I'll look it up in a minute. Um, it's escaping me the name of where that comes from, All right? So there's, with with so many different um, bullets out there, that means there's a lot of bullets around the world, right? So there's lots of variations with all of these things. But these are some of the things that we're really looking at here when we're looking at a bullet for trying to identify it. We're looking at the color, right? The cap color, you know, these caps, but also the pore color and the color that's on the stipe here. Right, you'll notice on, on the stipe here that there's more than just one color, right? At the top, the apex is yellow. And as it moves downward, it kind of turns red. Then all the way down here at the bottom, notice how it's white. Those are some of the things that we're looking at when we're trying to identify these things. Um, the staining of tissue when it's cut or bruised. So I selected this photograph here because we can see I took a knife. These blue marks here are slashes that I cut across the pore. And I can just kind of scrape them across the pores. And, I noticed that it was pretty quickly turning blue. You can see here where my fingers were when I probably reached underneath of this bully to pull it up out of the ground. Those are my finger marks on there. Um, we're looking at the cap surface, whether it's smooth. Sometimes they have you know little bits of hairs on them, like kind of felty. Sometimes they're scaly. We're also looking at the ornamentation that's on the stalk. So this one, I, I think we would call this smooth. I don't think there's much in the way of ornamentation on there, but if, you know, if I move back here on this one, this Boletus edulis, you can see that the artist was trying to show that there was some kind of uh, texture on the stipe. If you actually took your finger and ran that across there, you would feel some sort of uh, texture on there. Um, this is what they call reticulation. Um, and there's a bunch of different types of ornamentation. It can be reticulation, it could be scales, it could be little glandular dots. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, taste in the odor of the flesh. So bullets were often tasting them, doing a spit test, chewing up a little piece and spitting it out and trying to decide whether, um, you know, what it tastes like. Sometimes they're super bitter. And that's usually a pretty good, um, uh, a good thing to notice. Um, sometimes they're mild, you know, they have different flavors and stuff. The habitat, it's quite important to notice what they're growing with, whether they're growing with oaks and beech, whether they're in conifer forest, this fellow, as you can see, is growing in grass. And finally, growth pattern, right? You wanna see 
how it's growing, um, where it's growing, you know, whether they're super abundant, whether they're single, et cetera. <clears throat> okay, I just wanted to touch on this. I don't wanna to go too deep into this, but quite often we use chemical reagents and this is something that's very accessible to, to everyone out there. So what that means is that I'm using a little vial um, of ammonia or KOH, and there are some other ones that people use. These are the two that I use most commonly, and they're the ones that are, I think they're easiest to get a hold of. Um, the ammonia that I use is actually just household ammonia, just generic household ammonia. To make sure you don't buy one that's like in a cleaning solution or has soap in it, you just want straight ammonia. Um, and the KOH, um, if you Google how to get like KOH, you can find some ways of getting a hold of KOH. Um, but in this example here, this is ammonia that was dropped onto the cap. I'm not sure what kind of bolete this was, um, but it was a, you can see it had a purple cap surface to it. But when I dropped the ammonia on there, these orange streaks, this was almost instantaneous, right? Sometimes it takes a little bit, you know, it might take a few minutes to happen, but generally it happens pretty quickly. And this color reaction is notable. A lot of the literature that we use has um, these notes in them about what kind of uh, reactions that you will get. Okay, and finally, I'm just gonna share these couple of resources. So these are, this book here, Bolites of Eastern North America by the Bissets and William Rudy. Um, it's a pretty recent book. It came out within the last like two years, three years, something like that. Relatively affordable. I looked it up today. You can still buy new copies of it for under $50. You can find like used copies for like $30 on Amazon. Um, this is probably the best, I think the most accessible book for you know, the general mycologist, you know, the amateur mycologist, really good color photographs, really good keys. Uh, when it came out, it was, you know, completely up to date on all of its names. Of course, those names are changing rapidly. So they've probably already moved around a little, you know, a good bit, but still pretty up to date information on here. Um, so if there was any one book I was going to run out and grab that was specifically on Bolita, it would be this one. Um, this book here, The Bolites of North America, um, a compendium, this was re um, um, recommended to me by Igor. So Igor thinks this is a really good book. Now this is really more of a, an advanced book here. Um, there's no keys in it. There's no photographs in it or drawings. It's just strictly descriptions by Ernst Both. But it's a really, really comprehensive book of descriptions of North American bolites. Um, and you know, if you get a little bit deeper into the bolites, you might want to be interested, might be interested in this book. And then finally, this here, the Bolite Filter. This is a really good website. I'm actually going to go to the website. You don't, it's, a, it's, it's not super intuitive, in my personal opinion, um, but it has a lot of, it has 333 species in here of North American Bolites, right? And the way it works is it has a set of filters here has eight different types of filters and each filter you just click onto it and you pick out what is applicable so i'm just going to run through one and then i'm going to end this okay so in zone one if i hit the northeast it takes a minute to kind of run down it's telling me there's 213 of them and it updates so now there's 213 descriptions in here right you know if i come down to the next set the cap features you know i just pick whatever features I happen to have, we're gonna say yellow to orange, right? So when it updates, it's gonna just, it's gonna immediately work down to 100, 114 possibilities, right? So we can see how this is like going along, right? This is working its way through. I'll pick another four colors, 84 of them now. And this is updating over here on this side. See, it just updated with what's left there. Um, We'll just go to habitat, say deciduous trees. There's only 63 options. And what's interesting about this one is they actually have a filter for edibility in here, right? Um, so I um, it says somewhere in here that the uh, the creators of this site understands that many bully hunters, that's one of their main things that they're concerned about is edibility. So we can uh, actually filter on edibility. So I'm going to filter it to this one, to ones that says avoid, because there's only two of them. And we'll see what happens. Give it a second to update. This is updated now. And we now have, and it does have photographs. It's just running a little bit slow. Um, it's telling us, so it's a little bit, it, the website is a little clunky looking. 
I'll be honest, right? If I was giving some constructive criticism about it, um, you know, it says avoid over top of the name. It's kind of hard to read the names a little bit, but you can see it got me down to um, Boletus hernensis and Boletus minatolivaceus, right? And I can go into there and it should be showing me photographs. I think it does show photographs. I think I'm just running slow. But if I go into the Boletus hernensis, you can see it's got a fair amount of information. There's a slideshow of photographs you can toggle through, et cetera. So that's a pretty good website. I actually use, I use it on my phone. It works on my phone too, you know. Um, I have actually used it out in the field and actually had pretty good results with it. All right. So that is my, my quick synopsis here of what we're looking at tonight. I think we're making good time here. So like I said, I wanted to open this up to, um, to beginners or people that who have questions about this. Um, so let's just do that. Let's get our, um, like we always do, just put your name in the chat if you have stuff that you wanna share and we'll just go from there. First come first serve, right? And we'll go, like I said, until about 8.15 and then I'll take over again and share the stuff that I already have sent to me that I have queued up. All right, so is there anybody that wants to go first? Basically, if you didn't send me photographs, this is your turn. <laughs> Well, Kathleen, since nobody else is saying anything, go ahead, Kathleen. So you have five minutes, right? So we can share with everyone. So okay, show. let me let me do real fast. No, don't okay, rush. Um, there we um, go. Now we see. got some people coming. Okay, so I'm just uploading now. I know you said three, so I have several photos, but there's three. Okay, so there's twelve total. So I. I love bolites, but unfortunately, I don't know um, what these are. So please just shout out um, as you would like. So I'm trying to think this one. I think this was from the, hold on, let me go check. I think this was from the Adirondacks. Um, yes, this is my, ooh, no, it's not. No, this is the Princeton, Princeton Institute. That's where I got this, found the, this little guy. Um, I just kind of like, see how it's like, it's kind of pinkish, the, um, the pores um, and the, the stipe looks kind of like shiny. So it has those, um, what is it? I don't know if it's gyrations, I don't know. It looks kind of shiny. And like I said, the pores and the tubes, they look kind of pinkish. Did you taste Two, it? Me. No, I'm not at that level. I'm not so brave. Um, I'm getting to the point where I'm starting to touch it, but I don't, I'm not so sure I'll ever be at the stage of tasting. All right. Well, before, you, before, before you move on, though, does anybody yeah, have yeah. on the last one? Anybody have any suggestions there? Calopolis phileus, maybe. Okay. Is, no, is it edible? If, if 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 you had tasted just a teeny weeny bit, it would be mm -hmm. bitter, unless you're one of those that can't taste bitter. So you can, right away, it's the bitter bully if you can taste. Oh, it. okay. Uh, that that one is so bitter that that you can actually just put your finger and sort of rub it and put it in your tongue and you can mm -hmm. taste the bit on the on the board. Yeah. What no, I was I was going to suggest too because the pores are pinkish. That kind of pushes it towards Telopolis. Right. Right. <clears throat> yeah, it would, it would be nice if your picture was a little clearer at the top of the screen because I know. dark reticulation there, which is difficult to see. If there I are know. Reticulation, and this is not Thelius. This is a Telopolis, absolutely, 100%. Or Rubrobrunius? Uh, maybe. I mean, these, these things get brown all over and uh, they age and it's kind of tough, you know, from a photo, which is out of focus to get the, all the details. But as far as I can see, the stem is smooth and uh, it could be rubra brunius just faded, uh, but it's not Thelius. Well, first of all, Thelius is a conifer associate. And this was collected at Princeton Institute Woods, which is exclusively deciduous with a bit of white pine. And it doesn't grow with white pine. It likes um, uh, hard conifers, like you know, uh, 
um, Pinus Regida, uh, anything but soft pines and uh, sometimes hemlock. Okay. Well, there we go, okay. Kathleen. So definitely a Talapos. Okay. okay, thank you. I, I do have other pictures, but for some reason it did not load. Um, so I'm really sorry about okay. that. So the, the next one. Um, so the next one, this one is from the Adirondacks. Got this in the summer. Um, it was either on Tom Mountain or Cat Mountain. One of those because we climbed a bunch of mountains. Um, let me see, do I have more pictures? Yes. So, okay, I will admit it was fallen over and I propped it up by a rock so I could see it standing up. <laughs> um, so you can kind of see that. But this, so I guess if I kind of expand it, you can kind of see. Um, I just thought it was neat because all the other bolites I saw were were always like that red velvety cap. And then it went from like the the stem went from like yellow to red to the to the white. Um, so I just thought these were kind of neat to kind of see more like the blonde. Okay, well, look. One of the first things that strike me is the uh, you look at the cap, you can see there's black markings on those. Uh huh. Those are, those are scabers. What's that? That's uh, I don't yeah. know how would you describe yeah. it a scale on the stalk. So on, on the stalk. Mm, on the stalk, yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay. Okay, yep, I definitely see that. Okay, so this is the, that's it propped up against a rock. So I thought it was kind of, I thought it was cute having like the little sort of bell kind of curve to the, the cap. So so those yeah. scavers would make you think that it's something like a lexinum or something in that general region of the holy world. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, you lost me on that. Lexinum. So Marisol Lexinum. typed it in there, yeah. As okay. far as the species, I don't know. Okay. Uh, let me see. There is it on its side again. Oh, and then there's another one. Okay, so there's that one. And then this one, oh, goodness gracious. This might have been actually at Duke Farms, my other favorite place I like to go. Um, no, that's not that one. Um, yeah, this, this might have, or it could have been at the Princeton Institute. I'm sorry to say, which one? Oh, it's wait, okay. no, Th this is the Prince Institute. For some reason went out of order when I was saving it. So this is that other one that the first one. So those are more pictures of it. Um, oh, that see. looks like Tilopolis rubra bruneus to me. Yep, There's the dark you. staining on the top part of the stock. Yeah. Rubra what? Rubra. Um, some little darkish staining on the top part of the stock. Oh, and this species. Rubro brunia. Oh. Oh, okay. Rubro. Red brown. Bruneus. Rubro bruneus. Yeah, two ends in in the brunius oh. part. Yep. Okay. Lexinum. Wait, no, no, no. Pilopilus. But not lexinum. No, no, no. I'm fixing it. Rubro bruneus. Rubro bruneus. I got it. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So let's see if I have any more to move on. Okay. So this one, this was like in my local woods. I just walked to my favorite little walk. This was like teeny, teeny, tiny. I would say, and I'm really bad at measuring, um, like maybe two inches tall at best. This was also, even though it's propped up, I found it in the ground. Um, so I just propped it up on like wood just to look at it. So it's it's just propped up, but it was actually in the ground. Um, it was, I just thought it was just, forgive me, but I thought it was adorable because it was so teeny tiny and um, kind of cute looking. So I guess here you could see the tubes too. I guess it's probably kind of old. Um, where's the other one? There's another. Yeah, you can definitely tell that this is pretty pretty mature by how big those all that tube layering is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Does anybody have a, uh, a venture, want to venture a guess on that one? Yeah. I don't know if I got the first name wrong. Some something there. Was this terrestrial or growing out of wood? No, this this was out of the ground, but I picked it up and I propped it on this wood. 
So it's, okay. I, I put it on this wood. It's like a stump just so I can take a picture of it, but it was out of the ground. I see. It, well, it the, would be uh, good, good to know if there was any uh, bruising on the pores, like if you touch it hard. Mm, I don't yeah. see any on there. Yeah, and I don't know, like if it was like too old to do, whoops, sorry, too old to do that. Maybe. Oh, I am wrong. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, uh, have <laughs> the, tubes, the tubes and the size and the uh, shape of pores suggest this is something from Xeracomus or Xeracomelus. And uh -huh. uh, I would actually say this is probably maybe even Hortibaletus. That would be my best guess. So Hortibaletus okay. is a genus of small, very colorful boletes. They mm -hmm. have red caps and they have yellow pores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And stipes are yellow and red and they blue. Okay, so okay. Group. but it was split off from um, Zero Camellus uh, mm -hmm. in about 2015. And uh, this is what that reminds me of. The cap is red, you see some cracking. And uh, I don't think this is Zero Comus or Zero Camellus. This is Hortibaletus, in my opinion. The okay. stock is completely yellow. There's no red on the stock. It doesn't yeah, Harrisonii, doesn't um, Hortibolitus, Hortibolitus Harrisonii fit that profile? Well, I think there's it, some redness. It's probably just faded on the, on the bottom. Okay. I mean, it looks very yellow at the top, but when you go to the bottom, like I said, you know, the pictures are not very focused. Yeah, I know. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. And, uh, well, um, well thank I, you, Kathleen. Okay, thank that. you. Renee said that Hortobolitis um, rubellus is European. What about Campestris, Igor? It's possible. It's a very difficult group. There's no sequencing. There is no data. Some names have been merged. Um, it, it needs a lot of work, this genus. It's a fairly small genus. But for instance, the bully that um, uh, Luke showed uh, as an example to show the elements, you know, the one that had the scratches on the, uh, on the pore surface. Remember, Luke? That's yep. also Portia Yep. And that has a deep purple red cap. And I've see, I see it sometimes, and I'm going to sequence it actually. So I'm familiar with that bolete. And I also believe it's probably related to Rubellus. This wow. one could be Campestris. But again, there's probably more than Campestris in, in the Eastern United States. Oh. And, and they're, they're small. They're really small. Yes, they're small. They're very, very delicate and small. Yeah, thin, thin stocks usually. Um, yep, check them. <laughs> Check Hortibulitis has Harrisonii. I, that might be another another one to check. Right. Yeah. And I want to go back to that Luxinum that was in the middle. Uh, my best proposals for that would be either Luxinum longicurvipes or Luxinum albellum. Albellum. It did. It did have that that curve at the base of the stipe. Yeah, al albellum. Um, usually it grows with oak, and I think that was from the Adirondacks, right? The the, the scaber stock. But both of them do uh, grow with oaks, but uh, um, the woods that were shown in that picture were, I think, mostly deciduous. Yeah, that that um, I guess that second one. Yes. That was second. that was what? from the that was from the Adirondacks. That was from we were climbing either. Cat or Tom Mountain, if you're familiar with that, like the Lake George area. So that, yeah, that's, that's where southern Adirondacks, which could be oak trees and more deciduous. Igor, what's the other name? Lexinum albellum or? Longi curvipes. Oh, longi curvipes? Yeah. yeah. Let's see if that's right the way I wrote it. Long curved foot. It's, a, it's actually Lexinellum. Oh, no, it's not. Oh. It's not. Actually, it's been merged into Luxinum. Everything now is Luxinum. Oh, that's Luxinum now? Yeah, Albellum? everything is Luxinum. Oh, okay. Luxinellum was polyphyletic, always has been, and even more now than before. So that name is gone. Well, that's a rare bit of um, simplification. In the bully it, it is. I, I didn't like it. You know, I didn't like what the paper did, but you know, that's what the uh, statistic analysis of, of all these sequences, um, you know, came up with, and um, it was a big crunch out of you know, <laughs> big bang versus big crunch. Which one was are eliminating? You talking, are you talking about the pale lexinum that was shown earlier? 
Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the slender one with the uh, kind of a viscid cap, pale, kind of a yellow. Right. All right, cool. Penny, are you ready? And while Penny pulls up her um, her stuff, I'll answer. Dorothy had asked a question about that belief filter. Um, it was developed by the Western Penn Mushroom Club and it's like hosted on their website. It, so. it, yeah, I actually just found it today <laughs> myself. <laughs> it was actually Scott Pavel. He's mm -hmm. a member of uh, WPA. Yeah, it works. It really works quite well. I used it in the field on my phone and, you know, it's like it's having a nice little bullet compendium on me. I think, Igor, you helped develop the bullet filter as well, right? Uh, at an early stage, I did, yes. I'm not really involved in that anymore. All right, so tell us what you got there, Penny. Are you muted, Penny, or you're just not talking? I'm asking you to you. Un yeah, I'm asking you to unmute. There you go. <laughs> now I have to open my thing again. I, I don't know how to make it go open. Why don't you stop sharing and reshare? Okay. Oops. So I'm sorry. No, that's not it. I can't find my. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, stop sharing. Stop okay. sharing. Somehow I got your pictures are too big. Can you see that? We can see a small version of it. You might want to try to enlarge it with a little plus sign at the bottom. Is that there big enough? Yeah, we can see a fairly decent. Okay, decent. so I just have um, several pictures of um, a lexinum, which has got the scabers on the stalk. And uh, it was found in um, the edge of a hemlocks with some, where the hemlocks are just starting and a deciduous area that just ended. So, um, and I cut it in half and uh, first it, it stained pink, pinkish. And uh, this is also the Adirondacks. And then it got purplish, bluish, slowly. And uh, fairly large. So uh, I don't, uh, I, I think it's Lexinum and, uh, and Arantiacum, but I don't really know how to tell the difference between all the orange cap boletes that are in my Bissette book. But well, you definitely got it down to Lexinum, right? I don't know. Is there anybody that, like maybe Igor or Dave? Can you guys shed light on this? I don't. Okay. I don't understand so, these Lexinums like this. So this is Lexinum from section Lexinum, and these are all your orange and red capped uh, species. They also have a uh, marginal flap, and I think Rene Lebouf explained that in detail. Is basically the extension of the cuticle as a sterile tissue, it overhangs from the edge of the cap and it falls kind of underneath the, the pores, very irregular, wavy, you know, it varies in, in length. But this is the, the defining part of that particular section of lexinum that you're gonna get. You see those flaps? Yeah, kind of yeah, you know, I can tuck, see tucked that. in because it's still young. So yeah, they're kind of trying to hug the pore surface. And <laughs> as the cap expands, it becomes more detached from the, from the pores. Um, Arontiacum is a European species. It's oh, okay. uh, uh, promiscuous in terms of its associations with trees. It could be oak, it could be birch, it could be a, a, a other deciduous trees, but it's not found in the United States. It's an exclusively European taxon. So if you f c f call your, uh, you know, Rexham Arontiacum, you're, you're, you're going to be wrong, right? You know, out of the door. Um, 
You said it was growing next to hemlock, so I thought maybe it would be vulpinum, which probably occurs in the United States, but uh, the staining of that species is, is off. It should never stain pink. Other than that, we have many species of alexinum from section alexinum. They all look the same, and you can actually look up alexinum called alexinum monticola from Costa Rica, and it looks exactly like ours. You cannot really tell them apart by morphology, you have to do sequencing. You have to do DNA, and even then, you'll have to sequence type collections from herbaria and match them to your, your lexinum. So again, no studies, no comprehensive studies of lexinum in the United States. It's a, it's a giant, giant mess. And uh, we have many species, and we don't know what they are. So let me, let me just um, make sure I, I understand that right. So you're saying, the best thing to call this would be lexinum, section lexinum. Correct. And, and the key thing in section lexinum is that sterile tissue? Yes, and okay. the orange and red cap. Right. Yeah, I, I would call the cap color more red than orange, just to be able to, say, segregate this away from some of the orange um, birch associates. Um, oh, what's that orange one? Um, uh, I should have the, my book with me. Uh, but at any rate, yeah, the, the ones that are orange are really much more orange. Yeah, but, that, but they're the same yeah, section. Same, no, it, it doesn't matter. Same section, though. Right. right, same section. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah insignia. And, and then there's one pseudo insignia if that's a real thing. Okay. Um. The one that you showed, the first one, that, that, that one in the left uh, upper corner, it has a very dark cap, and that could be actually, that could be vulpinum if it was, if it was growing under conifers, because it kind of fits the, uh, the profile, has a dark brick, re uh, brick red to brownish red cap, and uh, lots of these blackish um, uh, scabers on the stalk. But uh, again, that's, that's just my guess, you know, and uh, most likely I'll be wrong. It's a very, very complicated genus because they all look the same, but at the same time, they're genetically distinct. And of course, they are mycorrhizal specialists. Some only grow with birch, others will grow with hemlock or conifers. Others will be uh, probably with a poplar. Um, uh, so again, lexinum is kind of a mixed thing. You know, you can maybe segregate them based on the on the habitat and the mycorrhizal association, given how particular they are to their hosts and not being promiscuous uh, in that regard. Uh, the only exception, again, is European orantiacum. But then, you know, you have to do sequencing to confirm species concepts, you know, dealing with the type collections from herbaria and so forth. This is a big project. And you Good said volpinum is never pink it just goes right to blue when you when you it kind of it. a kind of a grayish grayish blue yeah but not blue kind of fuscus what, what smith describes as a fuscus color um it's described by watling in 1967 so you can go to smith and Thiers at the bullets of michigan and the description is going to be there fuscus okay so um Now, my autocorrect uh, changed this. So this was um, near he, me in Pennsylvania, uh, Delaware County, um, a guild bolete. Um, all the pictures are pretty much the same. And uh, I learned from the talk that you can divide it into rhodoxanthus or leucomycelius mycelinus uh, if there's mycelium at the stipend it's white but i didn't know that when i collected this last summer so uh, i don't know what uh, how to further speculate on what this is okay allow me to interject i'm going to make a blanket statement here about philoporus um we have more than one species in each group. So we have species with the yellow mycelium and species with the white mycelium. It's not just leucomycelinus and rhodoxanthus. 
there are many more species that are undescribed and uh, there are several papers that have been published in the last 10 years and they, they involve DNA. And you'll see that we have probably at least twice as many, maybe three times species. And What's the name? The first, what? the genus. Philoporus. Philoporus. Philoporus? Yeah, P-H. Oh. P-H-Y, L-L-O. Philoporus, oh, okay, yes. thanks. Yes. So who knows what Luca mycelinus is? Because again, it goes all the way back to the type collection. You have to get the type. If it's still sequenceable, we have to sequence it and see what the genes say. And then you can dig up your modern collections and match the sequences and say, okay, we have a, a, a species concept based on these modern collections and hence it should be that. Same thing with Rhodoxanthus, um, more than one species. It's a species complex, if you want to call it like that. But um, it's a very complicated picture. Again, no comprehensive studies of this genus in the United States. The information in the, in, the, in, the, in the books is outdated. So you have to really, really go into the literature and start even looking at these things and, and see what they are, at least as operating taxonomic units, not necessarily as named species, but as operating taxonomic units. Morphology, DNA, that kind of thing. Okay. Igor, you said someone's doing a paper. Who's the author? Do you know? Well, Halling published uh, okay. one, and there were some okay. Chinese papers that were more advanced. You know, they have more information in there. I can probably find them in my uh, folder and send them to you if you're interested. I can do that. No, I just wondered who's working on it. Uh, no one is working on that. No, I mean, not not particularly in the United States on that on that genus. Again, all the papers, they were on Philoporus from other countries, mostly from China, and they included some of the collections that have been picked here, and they put them into the phylogenetic trees without, you know, much identification, you know, just as far, you know, species. Mm -hmm. So I want to, um, before you move on to your next one, Penny, so this one we have to leave at Philoporus, right? And Rita asked, um, what can we do as ecologists and morphologists? This seems like a lot of these are only distinguishable by DNA analysis. So I guess the the blanket answer to that is just you, you can only take it as far as you can. Like in this instance, we can only take it as far as philoporus or philoporus. And beyond that, the picture is just too murky to try to put a species name to. Um, and we're gonna either just have to wait for you know the information to become clear when somebody studies it. Um, yeah. That's still doing well to get to Philoporus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You you can get to the level of say group, which is sort of an unofficial distinction. Um, yes. If you see the bottom of the stock, um, yellow or white, but that that brings to mind a general principle for collecting mushrooms, for the purpose of um, discussing ID. You almost always want to make sure you get the entire fruit body, even if you have to dig up the bottom of the stock. So does that answer your question, Rita? Well, maybe it does. I can't I can't see you, Rita. <laughs> but. Okay. Okay, Penny, do you have another one to share? Yes, I do, if I can find it. Um this is on my thumb drive. Um, and I think I think uh, these are boron borangio. Oh, what happened there? Bicolor. Okay, we're, we're still seeing your uh phylloporus. Oh. Oops. Um, while, we, while you're working on that, Penny, I just want to put out there if, if um, I see Lila has a few to share. If anybody else has anything to share, um, put your name in the group chat, okay? Can you see that? No, I'm afraid not. Okay, well, I guess I can't share it because it's on a thumb drive. And it, that you can't see? There we go. We can see that. Oh. Okay, so I think that's Borangio bicolor. <laughs> I, I don't know how to get to my other pictures of it. 
That's a funny photo. What? That's a funny photo. Isn't it? They're they're all tucked together. And and this was in the Adirondacks, but there are some oaks, you know, in the lower lying areas. And uh there were a lot of oaks. And last summer they were these were all over the place. And see um, another, the underneath? Yeah, that's what I gotta see if I can find. Um Um, yeah, I would say for this, you probably can't really get it to anything without seeing the underside of it. Or, can you see that? No, I'm afraid not. Oh. Okay. So that's too bad. Yeah. So um, why don't we? So why don't, why don't we move on from there? Um, I would suggest Penny, you could always um email me your photographs, and I could probably put them together for you. Okay. So they will come together a little bit better. Okay. Okay. And I, in the future, I will put them on Mushroom Observer, but I just learned about that this fall and I wasn't doing that uh, last summer. So. Mm, right. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, Lila, you're up. And then after Lila, I don't see anybody else ready to go. So I think I will be ready to move into the ones that I have queued up already. Okay, start with this one. Not the best photos. Um, and you made your screen bigger? Oh, it. yeah, yeah. It's like this. Good. How's that? Yes. Okay, so this was growing um, in oak. Um, has some reticulation on it. What else? White pore surface. There's a closer uh, view of it. It bruised uh, this kind of tannish brown when touched. And I think the taste was mild. Igor. Yes. I saw something in one in the second photo. Can you show the second photo, Lila, please? Yeah. No, the other photo. The detail uh, when the stuff meets the uh -huh. Igor, I heard somebody saying that in some bolits the the pores there something that this could be, I'm not sure exactly. This could be fertile. Is that right? There could be basidia production of spores here. Is this reticulations of the stem or pores running down? Reticulation is the extension of the pore surface running down this, this type. And is so, it, so yeah. the reticulation comes actually from the uh, from the hymenophore, correct? Oh, so there is production of spores on this type. I that I don't know. Somebody uh, said that in one presentation. Because, because the tube, the tubes are the ones that have the uh, the surface that produces the uh, the uh, the basidia and the spores. But here we just have like a a thin layer of you know netting. Okay. So okay. I mean, it, it could have some it could have some cells in there that produce basidia conceivably, but uh, I don't know that for a fact. Oh, okay. Thank you, Lila. Sure. I didn't, I didn't section, well, I did section this, but I didn't take a picture of it. It was all full of worms. Hey, Lila, I'm certainly not an expert, but I would say that is not um, a Tylopolis. It looks more like a Boletus, maybe Veripes. It is, a, it is a Porcini. It's not Veripes. Um, it's not Veripes. We have many oak associated summer por Porcini mushrooms. And when I say Porcini, I mean section Boletus, something that's related to Edulis but not in that particular specific clade. So the staining that it showed pink, I, I think it was maybe color transfer or just some kind of a weird um, uh, artifact of digital photography. You know, to me, it looks like a, uh, a porcini type mushroom. So 
uh, it could be very piece, it could be something else. You have to do DNA. Okay. Yeah, and I cannot stress enough about that because we have a, a tremendous diversity of bullets in the United States. We're just touching the tip of the iceberg with those field guides and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's a, f a few other names. Um, Igor, what do you think of these names? At what is it? Atkinsonii? Is that one of them? Yeah, there's Atkinsonii. Uh, Reticulatus, I think, is one of Reticulatus them. Reticulatus is European. Uh, oh, that's European. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, this could be a member of the Arius group. So, if you really want to dig into the nomenclature and taxonomy of of uh, oh. Boletus section of Boletus, then it's split up into uh, Varipes group, Edgevus group, and Arius group. Arius has an AE, REUS, that's also European, European species. And depending on where they fall in terms of their genetic profile, you can associate them with any of those three uh, subsections or whatever you want to call them, clades. Um, but we, we, have, we have quite a few species that have not been sequenced, that have not been described, or maybe if they have been described, digging them out from the literature is going to be also not an easy task. You know, I think one of the difficulties of publishing anything new is making sure that it hasn't been published before. You know, in the mm -hmm. times of Peck and, and the Kaufman and, uh, and, and Singer, okay? Because those, those descriptions are so, so flimsy and uh, not informative that you have no idea what you're dealing with. And again, it all, all goes back to sequencing the type collections and anchoring species epithets through genetics. So I cannot, I would not be able to call this any name because I'm not sure what it is. And I really hate to give it a name which could be wrong. Okay. Get, guessing is not in my my nature. But can we can we say with any confidence that it's something in the Boletus genera genus? Oh, that, that, that definitely Porcini. Yeah, you definitely yep. Boletus section Boletus. Yes. Okay. There we go. So and, and I think that even though the brown bruise sort of suggests that you might consider Tilopolis, that the 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 netting on the stock is really tight and very coarse. Yes, and that seems more like a boletus to me. And more importantly, you can also see close to the stipe, the pore surface is covered with those cholecystidia. By the way, the oh, term, the, 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 pores term, the stuff. term stuffed yep. pores is incorrect. It's a it's a misnomer. You should never call uh, that kind of a uh, 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 morphological trait in Porcini stuffed pores. They are never stuffed. They're covered. They are mouths. The poor mouths are covered with a layer of chylocystidia, okay? So there's no stuffing at all. It's all external. Okay, cool. Is this depressed trench um, of significance around it here? No. No. Okay. You, you cannot really blink that to any particular species. Okay. Not in the Porcini, at least. Okay. Igor? And yes, what, what does the calocystidia do there? What's the function of it? Do, they, do we know? Uh, we, we don't, but apparently it's it's unique to uh, Balletus section of Balletus, almost ah, unique. Okay. So all, all Porcini, all genetic Porcini are going to have that uh, partial oh. veil. Okay. It's, it's, it's a type of a partial veil. It's not a true partial veil, but it kind of a, a variation on a theme because it is kind of covering the the fertile surface when the mushroom is very young and when it's getting older, it just, it just, it oh, uh, okay. attaches Thanks. itself and disappears. Right. So, Thanks. but the uh, um, cholecystidia is also present in some other boletes, particularly in uh, Butyria boletus, okay? And okay. Oreo boletus, oripes, if you know that mushroom, it also has a uh, has uh, the same kind of phenomenon on the pore surface, has a cover. Has a cover. But you can see like a film like a yeah, it's almost like a film, yeah, like a, oh, yeah, a very okay. thin kind of a cover, yeah, okay. yeah. You can you yeah. can scrape it off with a knife, essentially, yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, Lila, go back to that same area, that same time of year, because a lot of times it seems, at least my baripis come up in the same spots, same general location. Okay, all right, and if I can find a good one, I can eat it. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah, you usually need a lot of rain for these Boletus section Boletus. So what else you got there, Penny? 
I'm sorry, Lila. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, let's try this one. I think I find this one a lot too. I don't know what this one is. Okay. All right. So uh, a moderate sized one next to a really big one, um, the blue, blue green staining, pretty small yellow pores. Kind of tannish cap. It's sorry, it's overexposed there. Um, the color of the stipe, uh, very yellow at the top, and then kind of golden reddish. Um, and then it looks very white down here at the bottom uh, of the mycelium. So let's see what else I've got. Now uh, it's a little closer at the top. A bruising, um, bruising on the stem, Lila? Um, it's the lower part. There is some kind of bluish thing there. Yeah, I think there was some down. Okay. Did you section it? Let's see. I may have, but I apparently did not put that photo in if I did. Any ideas, anybody? I would say a land male at pseudosensibilis. That's right, Dave. I, I agree with you. That's what it is. What's the first name? Lan Ma Maoa. Oh, I don't. Ah, Lan Maoa. Okay. okay. Yes. Lan Maoa. Uh, what's the name? This the species? Pseudosensibilis. Pseudosensibilis. Sensibilis. I don't know if I wrote it wrong. Is that right? <laughs> Yes. Pseudo like in pseudonym, yes. Okay. So Dave or Igor, what what took you off to call it that? I just know the mushroom. I, I cannot explain it to you. I mean the, the cap is brown, it has more brown than, than the red. Uh the uh pore surface is yellow, the stipe is yellow too, with some reddish stones or or pinkish stones on the bottom. The uh, bruising is blue, kind of a sky blue on the stipe. It just, I'm just very familiar with this mushroom. It's very common. Okay. When you drop a drop of ammonia on the cap, it's gonna flash blue at you. The mm -hmm. only species that does that. And when you cut it in half or just section it, the flesh is gonna stain blue first, but then the bluing is gonna disappear and will be replaced by this reddish, vivid reddish brown Wow. color which is particular to the species no other lamaua does that to my knowledge okay cool not polyderosia not uh, there's a bunch of others that haven't been described but never mind that is that poison ivy in the upper right <laughs> yes it is yes <laughs> and does this grow with oaks igor yeah, yes this is an okay. oak associate yeah i only find it with oak I find it all the time, so now I, now I will start to learn it and know it better. Thank it's, you. It's a very, it's a very common species. Uh, it smells sometimes very funny. It has a fishy kind of an odor, especially when it's older. Uh, but other than that, it doesn't really smell like much, just like a regular bullet, you know, kind of a pleasant. So. Uh, Palo roseus is similar, uh, but it's usually a little more reddish on, on the cap. Yeah, it's more pink. And, Pal, pal, yeah, pink, yeah, Palo Rosius also, it smells really strongly of uh, beef bouillon or, or sometimes chicken bouillon. So sometimes you can identify that one by odor. Yes. Even and though this see, one has an odor, it's different. Yeah. This one again has a kind of a tannish cap, not much uh, uh, pink or uh, red tones in there. So this is one of the distinctive, dis distinctive features of Pseudocin Sibilis. Okay. Very good, thank you. Igor, there is a question on the chat. What's the question? Why do they turn blue, some of them, when you touch them or cut them? It's an enzymatic reaction. You know, there's a, there's a chemical that is being oxidized, I think, by an enzyme. And uh, if I get the chemistry exactly, there's a paper on, uh, the nature of staining in bolites, it's mostly chemistry. So, uh, but uh, it's variegatic acid, I think, if, you are, if I recall correctly, something like that. 
some acid? It's a, it's a chemical reaction. That's oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Is there um, anybody else here that wants to share any? I see Deb, you were trying to send me some, but you have to email them to me, okay? I emailed some more pictures of the one that I was trying to share, if you want to put them Okay. Up. Is there anybody else here that one has anything they want to share? We have about a little less than 10 minutes before I have to move into the ones that I have queued up already. Go on once, go on twice, speak up. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to share my screen then. Okay, so we can look at the rest of pennies. Here we go. Okay, Penny, you want to talk about these? We're just seeing a Zoom join a meeting. Yeah, don't see him first. All right, hang on. There you go. You see that? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, Penny. Oh, you're up. That's that's the the. Uh side view of the ones that we had before and uh, growing near oaks. Uh, I, I don't think I have a picture of a section, but when you cut it in half, it slowly bruises light blue. And I, I thought it was a, a boroangio bicolor. That's correct. That's what I would call that. And it was, I don't know if it always does that, but a lot of them were fused like that. It's not necessarily a particular feature of that mushroom or bolete, I should say, but uh, some of them do that as well. Um, it's, it's not something that you should be focusing on necessarily. It's, it's a common phenomenon in bolete HA. You know, you get the, the doublets and the triplets, you know, gregarious growth. Yeah. scattered or fused. Um, I think this is a bicolor, you know, uh, occasionally. There was uh, no odor, there was no odor. Yeah, uh, occasionally, Van Maua, Sudis, uh, not Sudis, not Sudis, Pallidorosia uh, can look very much like uh, bicolor because both of them have very thin uh, tubes and they are colored very similarly. Uh, but in my experience, bicolor has this brick dark, you know, deep red brick cap and 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 and, uh, and stipe, and uh, the color is more pronounced there. So that would be my guess. I would I would, I would call that bicolor. Igor and they also mentioned that how thin the layer of the pores is. Oh, tubes! I said that. Yes. But oh, oh, you said tubes. I'm so sorry. The tubes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Van Mao and Barangia have very thin tube layers. The, only there are only two like that. Two, With two, two genera. Thing? Correct. Yes. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Because Barangia only have one species in the United States so far. Van Mao is turning out to be a much larger genus. Oh. I would say we probably have maybe at least half a dozen species. Uh oh. All right. All right, cool. There you go, Penny. You got it. Thank you. Very nice. Okay. And there's like some questions in the chat. Um, uh, can somebody read them? I, I have a hard time looking at them when I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody wanted to know why why things turn blue. Um, Alexander yeah. was asking. Yeah. That was answered. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. I was reading something else. And then another one was. Um, explain what bicolor means in a bolete. No, um, I think it was referring to the red cap and the yellow pores. So, That's, like two. I think that one's named bicolor because of the two colors. Yeah, yeah. red and yellow. Right. Okay. 
We good there? There yeah. is another question, but I think that Igor answered it because he says, how do we differentiate the bicolor from other red cap bolids with yellow pores? So he mentioned that there are two groups that look, Igor, do you want to say? Well, it's it's more complicated than that. Oh, it's, okay. Again, it's a difficult group uh, because we have other bolides from other genera that essentially have the same kind of a description, you know, yellow, blue, bruising blue pores, you know, uh, red, red or reddish cap and uh, this type of yellow with flushed with, with, with red as well. Um, it, it, just, it just comes with field experience. You know, they have to be identified. You have to see these things multiple times. And it's just like, you know, differentiating uh, people. You know, you remember the face, so you know who it is by name. Same thing with the mushrooms. You learn what they are, and um, but you know, early on, they they it's it's a very difficult group. I can really add more to that than than that. Igor, how about how about this? Um, if you section a Lanmeoa, um, there tends to be a more widespread blue staining on on the interior flesh. Mm, yeah, but uh, Palo rosa doesn't stain much. So there are exceptions, you know, you, you yeah. have some generalities, but again, a Lan Mao are always thin tubes, okay? They have to be much, much thinner mm -hmm. than the cross section of the cap, you know, either above the stalk or in the middle, midway between the edge and the, uh, and the center of the mushroom. It's gonna be like, you know, at least three to one to maybe as, 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 uh, as large as like six to one ratio of cap thickness to uh, 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 tube thickness. By Rangi, by color, same thing. Very, very thin, razor thin sometimes in, in young individuals, tubes. Uh, uh, there's this bullet called uh, Pulcrobaletus sclerotiorum. The tubes are much, much thicker, but it also has a red cap and uh, red and yellow stem. Uh, maybe next time I'll show some pictures of that and you'll see what I mean by that. Um, but, you know, come to forays, you know, in New Jersey and uh, I'll try to explain those features to uh, to people uh, with multiple specimens of different things. That would be probably the best way to learn bullets. It's right. just you know experience you know in, in the field and coming to forays. All right, thank you, Igor. Okay, Deb, you have your pictures. They look like nice crisp photos. Can I tell us what you're looking at here. This is Deborah Mullen. We can hear anything. If you're uh, speaking, Deb, you are mute. You are muted. Hmm. Oh, any ideas? Anyone? Yeah, yeah she might be gone. I didn't see her in there. I, I would say Telopolis plumbio violaceus. Yeah, and really good picture of it in multiple mm -hmm. pictures, what we can see in the thumbnails. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, too bad those don't taste as good as they look. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Another one very, very bitter. It's a, it's a very common bullet in New Jersey and it grows in large numbers. I mean, last year was just, I uh, saw a tremendous number of these things, hundreds of them everywhere. A yeah, particular habitat? Painfully bitter, what's that? Particular habitat? Oaks. Oh, because I found it in Smithville and there were, it's almost beech and oak. So, yes. yeah. And somebody told me that the, the that I should taste the thing, and the first time that I found this one, oh my gosh, I yeah. have a big, I tasted Playing the thing, and it's an incredible, <laughs> disgusting taste. I would never yeah. forget that one. So, you need to have some water handy. Oh boy, that was bad. That looks like an oak tree in the background there. Yeah. Yeah, I find <laughs> it with beech sometimes. I find it actually up over here in Pennsylvania. I think I find that more often. Um, in mixed sort of beach, maybe some oak in there. And it could be really big. The ones that I found were huge. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the easier Tsavapalus species to identify uh, owing to, to the colors of the cap. Mm -hmm. When the mushroom is young, it's all purple. The cap is yeah. purple and the stem is purple, violaceous purple. And then as it matures, even when still young, the cap becomes brown like that, but the stem stays purple all the way into, into, into old age. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, again, two colors, purple and, and dark brown or, or medium brown. Of course, you know, the pore surface is white, uh, getting pinkish toward the uh, uh, age and the bruising brown, as far as I remember. You know, some of them bruise brown, some of them don't. I forget if that one bruises. But even without the bruising of the pores, you know, the combination of the stipe and, and, and cap color is unmistakable. You cannot confuse this bully with anything else. Mm -hmm. The only other bully that comes close is uh, Tilapolis um, uh, violet tinctus, but mm -hmm. it's paler. Okay, and uh, it's not as kind of a vivid purple, violet purple. What's the species so, so I can write it? Plumbeo violaceus. Okay, Plumbeo violaceus. It looks like Deb might have just uh, joined us again. Maybe she got kicked off or something. Is that you, Deb? Is this, are these your pictures? Okay. Well, anyway, ni nice pictures, Deb. We we appreciated them. So, plumio, doesn't that name plumio violaceous? Doesn't plumio refer to lead? And they were trying to describe the cap color, kind of a lead color and a violet stipe. Uh, lead in Latin is plumbum, right? So yeah. maybe I don't know. I, I have to look it up. In in the set in not, not the set in both compendium that you mentioned, Luke, uh, on the in the back of the book, uh, Aaron's both explains the meaning of the names for all oh. the Oh, great! So I could probably dig it up and answer that question. Okay. All right, cool. Well, very nice photographs there, Deb. If you can hear me, and the name was I think typed in. Okay, so now. I am going to move into these. So why don't we just start at the top and work our way down. Marisol? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So we have about 45 minutes left, guys, and there's seven of us. One, two, three, four, five, seven of us left to share. So let's just be uh, mindful of the time sharing. So take it away. Yeah, okay. So I know nothing about bolites. So these names, I got them with the help of Igor. I found this one before in Chatsworth. This one was found in Ch uh, in town, and this one was found in Chatsworth too, in a speed well. And um, at the edge of the path, under pines and oaks, and is the characteristic is that the stipe is very long, and it, it has a brown cracked cap and it has scabs on the stipe. And the pores are kind of, of white. You can see the, compar the color comparison with the color of the flesh and the color of the pores. That's all I can say. I, know, I don't know anything no, else. No staining on the cut flesh. Nothing. The no. key character for, for oh, this one. Oh, in this photo with the yellow? Yeah, is that no, the stain, like no staining at all. No, just no white, same. white flesh, and it stays that yeah. way. And sometimes the cap is white, or almost white. Oh, yes, it's sorry. a very morphologically variable species. The carp, the caps can oh. be as dark as these, and essentially pure white. I've sequenced several collections, and they all turned out to be the same thing. Okay. So this is, in my understanding, albellum. Uh, just a variation, you know, just a form of it, uh, dark, dark capped. Um, oh, okay, cool. So that's what I would call it. Mm -hmm. Nice. Everyone got that name right there? Yes, like sign right. and all bellum. Okay, I'll pause this for one, a second. The photos are not too good. I found those before the Lexino Nabellum, but a, a little further uh, on the road. And um, they were like ghost bolides to me, and they were kind of concolorous. And not too many things standing out. So I sent the photos to Igor and he gave me two choices. And I went to Bolito, Bolit's uh, filter 
site thing and one match the name that I put there. Santo Conion Stramineus, something like that. Stramineum, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it was at the side of the road with oak. The closest tree was an oak. Although it's the pine barrens, you know, um, sandy soil, yeah. Yeah, this, this, this mushroom actually was described by Mural, I think, from Florida. And it has a distribution uh, along the east uh, uh, coastal plain, Atlantic coastal plain, all the way probably into, I would say, Long Island. And uh, it's partial to the Pine Barrens habitat. So it has to be sandy, nutrition poor mm -hmm. soil, leaky soils, and a combination of oak and pine. So mm -hmm. it doesn't grow inland. It's, it's actually a coastal plain species. It's, yeah. It has a unique habitat niche. Ah, and, and one more thing. Oh, pardon, Igor, go. Yeah, and it's all white and uh, uh, or creamy, uh, cream to white uh, cap and stalk, and then pores getting darker. They stain yellow or brownish yellow. Oh, you can see that. Yeah. Yes, you can see that, and um, it's it's not a common yeah. frequent bullet. Yes. I maybe saw it maybe three or four times in the last fifteen years. And and one thing they say in the papers there is that it has a short stature. So you can see it's kind of very dwarf, kind of fat and short. Squat, yeah. Yeah. I don't find that here in Northeast PA. No, it's I've too far, too far, this. too far west. Mm -hmm. too far yeah, west. this is a cool one. Never seen this in my life. All right. Thanks, Mark. That was a good one. And then here's your last one. <laughs> and this one I asked help to Igor <laughs> and he gave me a speech and, and he mentioned something like campestris or the bolitos, I don't know the name. And these things were so tiny. I could not believe how small they were in front of my house. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Luke, and the, this, is, this is the same thing that you showed early on. This is the same speech. Uh, oh, the photo, the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The introduction. Yeah. yeah. And they stain. You can see I cut it. Yeah. So the Horoboletus. Horoboletus CF rebellus. So CF means conferare, compare with, you know, so oh. this probably as close to rebellus as we can get in the USA. That's my was the, was the Hortiboletus? Horti, horti, Hortiboletus, yeah, garden. Hortiboletus CF what? Rubellus. Rubellus. Double L? Ah, yeah. uh, okay. And and when I found them, I the soil is kind of poor in in that area. You can see it's kind of sandy, not not like the sand in the pine barrens, but it was kind of poor soil. And I thought they were so tiny because of the soil was poor, <laughs> but it's not. It's like the the way they are. Yeah, yeah. they're small yeah, statues. They're, they're small. They're small mushrooms. Yes. Yeah. In general, right. Cool. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Marcel. Yeah. Okay, so next down the list, so Yes. Right, these are some things I see often in the Adirondacks. Um, Swillis cavapes, the, oh, sorry, Luke, you, you have to show that, right? The, the hollow stem down the center here. Right in there. Absolutely gorgeous mushroom. And it's very common, and it seems to be mycorrhizal with larch, the tamarack larch. Um, beautiful yellow pores, kind of radial out from the center. And it's that beautiful felty kind of surface of the cap. And then the yellow sort of goes down the stem just the half inch or so, and then it's the brown. So it's very easy to identify. And when they come out, they come out in bunches. And they always, they never come out until starts to get cool, which is not usually before the 1st of September up here. Real common up here. One of my favorite mushrooms, though. Okay. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, we have, we have larch down here, but I never find this species. Yeah, this I find a lot around the edges of the big lakes and ponds up here. Oh, okay. Same place. <laughs> It's more of a boreal taxon. It's common to the northern tier of the United States. So we're kind of too far south for that. Yeah, I suspect that is the case. Or it could be. Um, okay, yeah, now, yeah, this is um, Swillus palustris. 
Folaster. Um, this has been in a couple of different genera, but they're this funny little pink thing that looks a lot like what we used to call Swillus pictus, now Spragii. And they're small, they're only about two inches. The biggest one over in the corner here might be three inches. Um, and this particular picture doesn't show how yellow the pores are and how they are somewhat decurrent, decurrent down the stem. But they also come out um, in bunches when they get the right temperature and moisture. Large, again, very specifically, and usually in very boggy, wet areas. Um, the first time I saw it, saw it, Noah Siegel found it, and he actually climbed down into the bog along the marsh to pick these. Um, the other thing, oh, and th then the next picture that was, yeah, the, the spore print is pink. I would not have thought of Swillis having a pink spore print, but this was noticeably uh, the color. Maybe that's why it used to be in a different genus. Yeah, it could it like Fusco, Fusco boletinellus, yeah. I think Bo, it was. Yeah, Fusco boletin, boletinellus. Bo, boletinus. Um, a boletinus. Right. That this has not been finalized. This, pre, this particular spore print I was making for Rita's Figulus down at Duke University. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been as clever to get spores like that. But it's a nice little mushroom, and it has to be usually very cold before it comes out. Um, oh, spore, spore print on wax paper? Yeah, it's in a wax bag. That's what he requested, uh, which works really well right in the bag itself um, for the way he was going to use them and study them. But oh. you can see my writing backwards on the outside of the thing to identify. <laughs> that is a but good idea. A, good way to save them. It's one of the last mushrooms I see in the fall, cold weather. And this thing here, this, I went round and round with different names, which is why you'll see Ceratinus inviscidus, um, but it's a funny swillus that is fairly common up here. Also, not usually until it's a little bit cool. And it's gray underneath, grayish brown on top. When it's wet, it's really slimy. And you can see that the pores are very white. The ring is very viscid, kind of sloppy. And then uh, it goes this kind of beautiful gray color. And you can see also that when I cut it in half, it has this funny blue kind of pale, slowly blue coloring. Oh, and it also down at the stem, uh, the bottom of the stem on the lower left, uh, it turns kind of blue green. There's some kind of funny chemical acid or something in it. And it also stains the wax bags that color if it sits in the bags too long. But it's a really fun little interesting mushroom, also mycorrhizal with the larch. In boggy, wet areas, you can see the sphagnum moss and the, uh, whatever the other moss is there. All right. Yeah, that blue staining is very unusual for Chinus suillus. Yeah, well, it's, it's these particular ones that were shown were very fresh. Mm -hmm. What is this one, so? Sabarius. This is one that's particularly interesting to me because if you look at it quickly, it looks like Swillus americanus, mm -hmm. but it isn't. It, it, the underneath of it is quite a lot different. The pores are very tiny, uh, um, very tight and close together. Yeah, it's, well, I should have showed you a better picture, I suppose, but, but it does have that kind of red veining like uh, on the cap surface and, um, they're a little bit bigger usually and meatier than Swillus americanus. So I knew right away it was uh, something different. And it took me several years, and not until I saw um, uh, Renee LeBeouf was zooming through her millions of pictures one, at a foray one time. I said, wait, that's it. And um, anyway, this turns out to be interesting because this particular collection was also collected for uh, Rita Spiegelis down in uh, Duke. He believes it's with Aspen. He has somebody, he's been doing a world study of Swillis, but anyway, he's got somebody who's thinking that this is with Aspen, poplar Aspen, big tooth Aspen. But anyway, Rita's got very excited about it. But if you remember in um, Rene LeBeouf's uh, talk the other night, for the, most of the Swillis are all with conifers. 
except one species. And I think this is the one species. So I don't think, I don't know whether you guys have this down there, but yes, I, we do. do you? Yeah, yeah, I found last year at Stoke State Forest, my first time ever. I find it with oak. Yes. Oak I'm wondering if, it, if there might be a split required here. Um, or whether it's one of those that can jump posts. Yeah, yeah, there's. I collected some for a graduate student once who was actually studying that uh, specifically about um, soil subarius, and I actually dug up a bunch of soil and and put it in a bag and overnighted it uh, through FedEx or something. And yeah, um, well, that's she, so she didn't find what, any. She didn't find any DNA from the host, though, unfortunately. What's interesting to me is that I find it like most boletes in the exact same place every year. So I have a couple of places or at least one really easy access one to find. To yeah, find. I find I find in the same places too. And you know, I, maybe I'll look a little more closely and see if there's a poplar nearby. Um, but I know that a prevailing opinion on that species is that it's an oak associate. But if you're finding it up in the Adirondacks, yeah, and there's no oaks in sight. Yeah, there's no right. oaks up there. No so oaks. I'm wondering if there might be two different species. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah. Well, it is something of a lookalike for Swillus americanus. Yeah, no partial veil. Yeah, and the Never. Swillus americanus, the, the pores are much, much bigger. Yeah, yeah, they get really big. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I need to say. Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. All right, Nina. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> Okay, what I tried to do is I got so many of these these uh, fungi, uh, the the bullets from so many places. I tried to get um, ones which had been found in several forays by people, um, and this is uh, um, this used to be it, it's Calliobolitis in edulis. Um, it's we have found it. We, uh, we found, oh, at Stokes last, uh, we found it at Stokes and we found it uh, a whole lot of different places. Um, and it's, it, I think, it, I guess it's, it's a dead of us because you can't eat it. It's not, it's pretty bitter, I guess. I don't know too much about it, but yeah. Okay. Well, all members of genus Calabaletus are bitter. This is the, the distinctive feature of that genus. Um, they don't have any mild tasting species. Um, this could be an edulis. The cap are kind of darker. So an alternative proposal could be uh, Calabaletus uh, rosy peas. Okay. Um, and they are closely related, but I think they can be distinguished by DNA. So they are definitely different species. Yeah, I, um, I picked some um, Calabolitis uh, roseopes and uh, several people on Mushroom Observer said that it was um, in Edulis. And I sent, it was a collection I sent to North American Mycoflora and it got sequenced and it, it turned out to be roseopes. So they're, they're pretty similar, really. They're hard to tell apart. Yeah, I think roseopes usually has a much darker cap, it's more brown than tan. Um, and it's, I think, partial to hemlock, whereas uh, in edulis is an oak associate. So they might be, might be a difference in terms of its, uh, in terms of their association with, uh, with mycorrhiza, uh, with, with trees. Well, that makes sense to me because the ones I find, um, there's usually hemlock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's hemlock in this. I, there's two or three spots where I find them. There's hemlock in all of those, all of the spots. All right. So here's your okay. next one, Nina. This was one that Renee showed, but she, her, her um, the uh, um, Xanthaconian Apennine uh, didn't have the uh, dots in it. So I, I thought it would be interesting for people to see the dots uh, for the uh, um, Xanthaconian Apennine uh, maculosus. The pine barrens? No. Where? Uh, this was gotten at um, several places. Uh, it was gotten at, well, yes, we did get it at Pine Barrens. Way, oh. way under. We got it as, uh, it's up in the Salins, Ball Pate. Um, lots of places we get it. 
Yeah, we used to find this everywhere in New Jersey years ago. Beautiful. It's usually hardwood, right? I'm, yes. Uh, yeah. And if you get to it before the bugs, which is rare, it's a good <laughs> idea. Yeah. Here's your last one. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is uh, this is a peculiar one. It's 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 an oddball. It's uh, it's Boletus rudi rudii, and it's only got one eye. Um, I put two eyes, I think. No, you oh this one eye then. Um, and it's uh, it it doesn't stain. Um, you when you cut it, it doesn't stain at all. And it's uh, it, yeah, I don't. It's it's uh, Igor helped me with this identification. And it I guess it's a southern mushroom. Where did you find it? Uh, uh, right on right on my hill here. Oh. Uh, in oak. Oh, well, oak, uh, nuts, all sorts of hardwoods. Yeah. Yes, this is another a red and yellow bicolor type bolete, but uh, it doesn't stain at all blue. It doesn't bruise blue at all. Not even a hint of that. It has uh, long mm -hmm. tubes, so it's not biorangia. That's how you can separate it from biorangia. And it's very rare in New Jersey. I only know of one location where I find it. Um, but it was described, I think, either from West Virginia or Virginia, something like that, from the South. But uh, when I contacted uh, one of the authors on that paper, um, Dr. Beatrice Ortiz Santana, she was surprised that we find it in New Jersey because she thought it was kind of too far north for it. But yet it's here. Mm -hmm. one, one thing for a beginner to notice here from this photo is you can see, even though this is a fairly young fruit body, the thickness of the tube layer is comprising probably over 30% of the uh, thickness of the entire uh, section cap. That would be a way to eliminate uh, Bayerangia or Lanmeoa. Hmm. Yes. All right. Cool. And the, the coloring at the base is peculiar of that species because it's different, quite reddish. It mostly has a yellow stipe with a little bit of red. That's what oh, shows okay. here. And uh, my experience with the species is basically the same. The stipe is like at least 80% yellow. Okay. And on the bottom, only on the bottom part, you start seeing some, some splashes of red okay. or pink. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Nina. All right. Okay, here are my three. Which ones do I want to show here? I'll show this one. This is Boletus nobilis, which I find in the same spot every year, sometimes quite abundantly. So this is one of the ones that we would put in the Porcini group, right? So you can see, I tried to collect a couple, you know, starting out pretty young where the pores are still really tight on it. Um, they always have this like, kind of like, I don't know what you call that color there, kind of like a leathery tan color. And they often have a little bit of pitting in it. See this kind of uneven mm -hmm. pittingness to them. And the stipes are always white and pretty heavy reticulated. If I, on this next one, if I, zoom in here a little bit. You can see this reticulation right there. Great pictures. Great pictures, Luke. Thank you. So these, if I can, they're usually, they're usually, the insects like them a lot. They always grow like in July in my area, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, they live really like the heat. So like when it's really hot and really wet, and of course the bugs attack them pretty quickly, but um, they're worth uh, oak and beach. So oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure which one. The woods where I find them are so mixed. So okay. it's an oak and beach forest. So these are a really good edible. I collect every one of these I can find. <laughs> okay. So how high is your tolerance for bugs? Uh, pretty high. Is you it? Know what, you know, you know, you know what I find. Actually, if no. I bring them home and I put them in my refrigerator, don't tell my wife this, okay? But if I put them in my <laughs> bag, 
in my refrigerator while they're fresh, it actually drives a lot of the insects out. I think the uh -huh. insects freak out because it's cold and a lot of them come out. So they, they stay in the bag or something and then- yeah. Yep, yep, and then I just dump the bag out. It's just freak out. It's a good <laughs> trick. I also find that if you cut them, they start, uh, the bugs, the, the worms, you know, start leaving the mushroom like uh, like like a big exodus, you know, they yeah. just leave it all at once. Yes. Just, just merely cutting the mushroom in half will do that. <laughs> Mass evacuation. Mass okay. evacuation, yeah. <laughs> okay, so this one's Telopolis baluii. Oh, was a good one. <laughs> I only have one photograph of it, but it was a decent photograph, which I thought so i always find this along the creeks in southeastern pennsylvania so really commonly in the summertime and um they have these really nice orange color to the cap and the stipe has this orange blushing to them um so they're telopolis and they're usually bitter when i taste them I, I keep reading that they're sometimes not bitter and if they're not bitter they're edible but i've never tasted one that was not bitter um, Wait, the one, the second one from the left, the orange, here? there is an orange inside the flesh, no? Um, eh, it's oh, not it's clear so enough to really tell. Yeah, the, this, this, it kept growing after the slug ate it. Oh. What that is. Hmm. It, it might be some pigment that's, that's uh, seeped yeah. out of the, out of the uh, cuticle as well into the yeah. little it's, it's not staining it's definitely not staining yeah because if you look up here yeah, those, they don't stain i don't think yeah if you look up here you can see the orange does kind of leach down a little bit a little bit yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that's what i would think what do you think igor species complex yeah i think i think it could be a species complex because these baluii are in australia they're different and there are multiple species there too so we have baluii everywhere in the world probably and um, in the usa yeah I think it's a safe bet to say that it could be more than one species. That would be my guess because everything turns out to be a species complex in this country. <laughs> I, I found a few once in Cape Cod. It was like the only mycorrhizal mushroom outside of uh, Russula variata uh, that I found on that August and Cape Cod. We do find them in the Pine Barrens occasionally, and uh, but I found them like in more inland, in like pure deciduous woods with different kind of soil. So that's why I think, you know, based on the habitat, you know, maybe it's possible that we have more than one species. So mm -hmm. I'll probably sequence them eventually. There's so many things to sequence. I don't think I have enough money to do that. <laughs> okay, here's my last one. Uh, Pseudoboletus parasiticus. So, you know, like I was saying in the beginning that most of them are mycorrhizal, but we do know that there's some that seem to be parasitic. So this guy, here's the bolete, and that's growing on a uh, scleroderma citrinum. So I saw a lot of these this summer. This summer, oh. this was the year for them. Yep. Yeah, I'd only ever seen them once before in my life, like one occurrence of them a number of years ago. And then this year, just tons of them. Mm -hmm. I actually, mm -hmm. And I actually found somewhere the bolete was not actually growing out of the, the the puff ball um i would find ones that were it was growing out here but i would also find a few random ones that were an inch or two away from the puff ball hmm. it must have been it might, attached. Be, might be parasitizing the mycelium that's, was a, a that's what i was thinking mm -hmm. yeah because you can see in here you can see the mycelium is all mm -hmm. kind yep. of through that. and yes this year and last year i've seen um like three times as many as what I've seen the rest of my many years of looking for mushrooms. I always wanted to find it. And finally this year I found it two times in my park near my house and in many forays we found it. Yeah. Very common this year. Awesome. All right, we got three people left. We're right on time here, guys. So Dorothy. Okay, this is... Um now known as uh, Buteri boletus, um, frosty eye, um, which I found um, in the Great Swamp in 2007. Um, I haven't seen it since in that location. Um, I'm sure, I'm hoping Igor will agree with me. <laughs> Yes, I mean, it seems like it's frosty eye, but I heard a rumor that we may have two frosty eyes, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, ne next time I have to get a better description, but 
that was way back um, more than 10 years ago. Next. Um, That's the general description though, that, that fits it really well. The shaggy reticulate stipe, uh, the, the apple red cap color and the, and the red pore surface. Um, so it seems to fit the general description very well. I, people tell me these are edible. I've, I've never found them though like up here. I've just seen them at big forays. I've, I've eaten them before. They're very sour. Yes. <laughs> but kind I'm of a dusty flavor. Yes. But, but kind of in a good way though. Not like bad sour. Like like I could work with them. Like what did I do with them? I um I just had, I think I did some kind of butter sauce with them. So they were kind of like a lemon butter sauce, but with the mushroom <laughs> flavor instead of lemon. <laughs> Maybe with fish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sour for fish. Yep. Yeah. They were good. I liked them. <laughs> Beautiful picture, Dorothy. Oh, yes. thank you. Um, this I found almost 10 years ago at the Wildlife Observation Center. That's the WOC, also at the Great Swamp. And I had never, ever seen an underside of a, a bully look like this with the yellow edge and these orange pores. Uh, and it does stain. The, um, when I tried to identify it, I came down to Belitis discolor, but since um, I heard uh, Renee's talk, this is now a neo but um, the reason I switched to neo was because of what uh, the Western pen Bolete filter said about it, and um, it won't even be discolor anymore, but um, maybe sub loridellus. So neo is sub loridellus, or perhaps, perhaps uh, lordo, trying to read my notes and the, my don't have enough light here, lordoformis. So I don't know, what do you think, Igor? Um, same story, uh, difficult genus with many species. I sequenced a lot of Neobaletas and in the Northeast, we have at least six species. Uh, have they been described by Smith and Thiers in Michigan 50 years ago? Possibly, but who knows what they are? You have to go and sequence the types. Um, I do think this is a Neobaletas. Um, again, the name, I wouldn't put any name on it because I, I don't know what those species are. Um, I've read descriptions by Smith and Thiers thousands of times, and um, they sort of all kind of blend in. Somebody did a study uh, maybe 30 years ago uh, on the types of, uh, of Neobaletus from Michigan, and they came to the conclusion that all the microscopic features of those species, they are kind of interchangeable. They all share all these the same elements, the spore ranges, the basidia, the cystidia, they all kind of look the same. So maybe, you know, they've been describing the same species more than once. It's, it's a possibility. Uh, I cannot name this bully. I mean, I, I would agree with you, Dorothy. It's a Neobaletus, and that's exactly what, what I think it is. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have never seen one since. So. <laughs> Look, excuse me, Dorothy, there are, there are two questions on the chat. Oh, okay. Can somebody read them? One says, uh, it was, oh geez, the last one. With respect to harvesting etiquette for bolides and to promote future fruiting and no damage the delicate mycelium, best way is to twist, pull, or cut. Okay, you know what? Let's if it's not about the let's let me address those questions at the end, okay? So okay, that okay, we're okay. not interrupting these guys. I'm sorry, uh, Dorothy. That's okay. Okay. Um, was there anything else about the neobolitis? No. Nope. Okay, here we go. And, and this was at Thompson Park, um, Lanmoa, Pallido rosea, and it's identified by <laughs> Igor. And this is the, the wonderful one that, that, that smells like um, bullion, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, great, great odor. Uh, and here you see, when it's young, how small the cap is, and yet hmm. how large mm -hmm. uh, it can grow. So wow. that's that's why I put it in. 
and, and look how closely the young fruit body resembles by color. So if you would take a look at this picture without any details, you probably say it's by color, but it's not. And I've been fooled by that more than once. So you really have to smell these guys because when they're young, they look almost like by color. All right, so that's Lenmoia pallidorosia. Often called the bullion belly. Right, because it smells like beef bouillon, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dorothy. Okay, Liz. Okay, start with Oropes. Yeah, this is my favorite bully. You know, I love this bully too. It is absolutely beautiful. And um, I found it originally just cruising on my bicycle. I drive my husband crazy because he likes to go fast and I like to cruise around and pick up mushrooms. But uh, <laughs> anyway, this one, it's, the sets call it the golden yellowfoot, which is appropriate. Um, and you can see that there's a velvety, beautiful brown um, covering on the cap. And uh, the pore surface is whitish yellow, but I would consider it yellow pretty much. And when you cut it, the flesh is blue and it doesn't bruise at all. I never got any bruising with it. And I guess these kind of have that same stuffed pore. The yellow, we're not supposed to stay stuffed anymore. Don't, don't say stuff, that's a no, no, no it's stuff. Stidia in the pores, okay. Yep. They have the same sort of thing. And you can see uh, the stem has beautiful reticulations. Please? Yes. You say when you cut it, the flesh is blue? No, it doesn't turn blue. Oh, 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 okay. And it is um, a really nice dense mushroom and it, it cooks up beautifully. I really enjoyed this one. So it does tend to come up in the same spot every year. Of course, this was in somebody's lawn and uh, <laughs> it wasn't under an oak tree, but there were oak trees, not too far. I guess it might've been under the drip line for them, but um, I find them pretty much every August in the same area. Some years I get a lot, some years I don't. And as Dave said, they really like rain. So it, um, I tend to go out and scout for them after it rains. I want to comment on this bolete. It's a very unusual bolete in terms of its overall morphological profile. There is there are no lookalikes of it. The only thing that re resembles it somewhat distantly, or maybe not distantly, but uh, to some extent, let me say that, is uh, Retiboletus um, ornatipes, which is also mm -hmm. species. But when I sequenced this bolete, it turned out to be a member of a fairly new genus called Tangio boletus, which was described from China. So we have a single representative of that genus in the United States so far. Okay, so it's a very special bolete, not because only it's beautiful and edible, but because phylogenetically, genetically, it's very distinct and unique. What is the name of the genus again? Yeah, what's that name? <laughs> Tengio, T-E-N-G-I-O, Tengio boletus. Okay. And that's what our boletus or oreopes is? Yeah, I would call it, uh, well, on MO, I transferred it into a new genus. It's a, it's a provisional name, obviously, but I called it Tengio boletus oreopes. Hmm. Okay. Bernard's Hill Cemetery. <laughs> what All are right. Mushroom. And uh, it does seem to come back every year, which I like. Okay, do um, Carminoporus, and I'm glad Igor is on this Zoom tonight. It has a little shout out to Igor because he helped me identify it. He actually sent it off for sequencing. So I find this in um, Clayton Park in a very oaky area. And um, you can see it's a beautiful kind of smooth velvety red pores or um, cap color. And the pores are bright red. But originally, I was a little bit confused by this because when they're really, really young, evidently they're yellow. And I thought maybe we had found like a, a bicolor bolate. But um, as they mature, the pores turn red. The flesh itself is um, blue. And it doesn't stain much. I think it, when it gets older, it does stain a little bit. But um, not a lot. There you go, Igor. It's a shout out to you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed the name. Carminiporus. Carmen, mm -hmm. because that's a carmine color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes, genetically, it's a member of genus Van Maoa. So uh, again, you can provisionally transfer it to Van Maoa, but it hasn't been published yet, officially. 
but the genes indicate when you cut this bully, they has a thin uh, tubes, uh, uh, tube layer, and uh, that's where it belongs. Uh, and usually it has a red color of the pores, so it's an outlier uh, from that genus that consists almost exclusively, other than this one, uh, of bullies with the yellow pore surface. But it's a Lamaoa, that's for sure, a bon bona fide one. And it's interesting because it, um, when I was looking in the guidebooks, it's more of a southern species, so I wasn't really sure about it. But once Igor did the DNA on it, then we're pretty sure that's what it is. You know what? Skip the one with a question mark because that's going to be another one of those white poured kind of oaky mushrooms we're not going to get. And go with Edgels because nobody's shown that yet. And uh, these guys, obviously, I love. And um, I find them consistently every year. I find them usually under, um, these were under white pine, but I also find some under uh, Norway spruce. And you can see, I, it's not a terrific picture, but you can see the big reticulations. And as you get closer to the stipe, you can see them a little bit better. And it does have those sunken, um, the sunken uh, pores near the stem. And it has the chylocystidious stuffed pores. They're in there. It doesn't stain when you cut it open, it stays white. Although I found on some of the older species that the pores, they turn eventually an olive green color. But um, the caps on some of those, it does seem like some of the, the maybe reddish brown color from the cap bleeds down on the much older specimens. But I don't know if that's just from my knife cutting it. Or the cap what. looks, the cap looks weird. No. It, they are kind of pitted sometimes, but I wouldn't oh, okay. call it rugose. Well, that's what it means. It's actually oh. pitted. Rugose means pitted. Okay, well then I guess it is rugose. It, it's, it's, that's not a consistent trait, though, I would say. Okay. It's the Norway yeah. spruce, the conifer edgeless. It's sometimes it isn't, sometimes it isn't. Yeah, and I usually get a fruiting of these late June, early July, very, very quick, and usually right after it rains. And then they start in earnest in September. And I've picked them, not this year, but I picked them through mid-December. You know, I tend to go back every few days to this place. And I have this place was, Liz? Um, we're going <laughs> to Forget about it. <laughs> we don't get it. <laughs> North America. North America, yes. Yeah, we're going to say Sussex County. <laughs> All right. But I have to say that um, these, the white pine ones I get, for a long time. The ones that I find under Norway spruce, I only get briefly. And I have about five places actually that I do find them. But they, five places? Wow. <laughs> well, cruise around. <laughs> yeah. Goodness. Well, thank you, Liz. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. Thing. And, and Dave. Say, Igor has been wonderful helping with things when I'm uncertain about. So thank you. So. All right, sorry, we're running a little bit over tonight. I tried to do my best to move everything along, but you know how it goes. I'll, so, I'll go fast. Well, you do, you do your three. You get your shot, Dave. What do you tell me what you want to do? Uh, the, the three on top, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I put some other ones in in case there was a shortage. I didn't really think there would be, but I have so many interesting uh, bully collections, really. So this is something I've never found before until this year. It was in Oakwoods. Um, and I thought it was Boletus sensibilis, which probably should be transferred to, to Len Mayo anyway, uh, but it hasn't been. And I showed it to Igor, and he suggested this um, relatively new species, Boletus sensibilior, um, which is a Eve's Lamoureux species. Um, and I've, I've sent material to Igor, and he sequenced it, and it, it looks like that's what it is. Yes. Um, so it's a pretty interesting ball lead. It's a bit red and yellow, not too much red on the stem, but it stains like crazy um, when you when you scratch the pores or section it. It goes really, really strongly blue. Um, so I, I tried to not handle it too much at first, um, and so I think some of the subsequent pictures. Uh, we'll see the, uh, the ah, there we go. So that, that I mean, that's what I call blue staining. So, yeah, the, the same thing on the on the pore surface. If you scratch the pore surface, you get, oh, there we are. That's when that one was found. 
And um, so that was that was a, a pretty cool collection. And like I say, it's been sequenced, so we have a confident name to, to put on it, and and it's a relatively new name. So also with many Lanmeola species, you'll get a blue staining at first, like you saw in the other pictures. But then after a while, maybe a half an hour or an hour or maybe a little more, the blue stain changes to a, either a brown, tan or a brown or sometimes a reddish brown. So you can see here the two different stages of staining. Um, what I did was I this had been sectioned earlier, and that's the part that, that turned like tannish brown. And I took the other half of that cap and sliced it again um, to, to see the, the initial sort of color of the stain. So you see the two different staining colors there, the initial staining of blue and then the fading to the uh, brownish. Um, so, okay, so that, that was the first time I ever found that species. Um, and let's see what we have here. Oh yeah, here we go. This is an interesting one. This is a, a king bully that stains blue. So sub say rulison. Sometimes it doesn't stain. I have made collections that I believe are the same species um, that, that didn't stain. But you see here where I scratched the pores. Um, and I think there's another picture here where where that's was yeah. where I waited a couple more minutes and it it stained the, the stain got a little darker. The stocks on these are usually brownish and coarsely reticulate. And some, sometimes the, the reticulations are so thick and, and, and um, coarse, it looks like a Jackson Pollock painting. Um, th this one is not quite so prominent, but this was probably the best example that I had um, on Mushroom Observer of, of this species. Also, it's sometimes the pores don't bruise blue. Sometimes the blue bruising, and you can see there, see it got a little bluer after I waited a little while. That's that same scratch. But sometimes you won't see the blue staining except where the cap context meets the layer of tubes. So you would have to actually peel off some of the tubes and then the context um, that where the tubes had been attached. Sometimes you'll see the blue staining there. Uh, but this is, in my opinion, um, at least as good and edible as Belita sedulis, um, and, and may, maybe even better. Um, the, the flesh is really dense um, and, and really strong flavor. This is a really good mushroom. Um, usually pine, white pine, maybe with some oaks nearby, but I think there's one or two spots where I found it where it was mostly hemlock. And I believe Igor found this at Stokes. Correct. So, yeah, correct. Yeah, I think maybe even last year, or was it two years ago? It was one of it the was, Stokes it was, it was last year. I, I went there on my own. I found it there, and it was uh, with hemlock. There was no oak nearby. Yeah, there's a couple of, one spot I found it seems to be only hemlock, or if there was a it's, pine there, I didn't notice. I, I think it's a conifer associated species. It's not yeah, it's a conifer species. species. Yeah, I. that's what I would say. I have a good picture of this from the Canadian exhibit in Montreal a few years ago, and it's about three times the size of this. Uh, yeah, I've got a, I've I've got a few pictures on other observations but, that are about. Two makes or three me think times. that it may be a, a more common as you go more further north with pines. And Probably, yeah, yeah. There's there's something they find it in the south though that they're calling Boletus pseudopinophilus that is very similar to this, but apparently it doesn't stain blue. And I, I think it would be interesting to see how the sequences match up for the that southeastern pine associate, Boletus uh, pseudopinophilus and, and this and this thing. Well, yeah. I can tell you that if you compare the sequences of this mushroom, uh, subsumulescence, mm -hmm. with the European pinophilus, and also a couple of species from uh, uh, from the uh, from uh, Western North America. They have essentially identical ITS sequences. And uh -huh. I read one uh -huh. paper from a few years ago that essentially they treat it as a single species, mm -hmm. which they are not. 
So if hmm. you have identical sequences, it doesn't mean that you have same species, okay? Um, the, 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 there are different phenomena uh, uh, involved where ITS fails to um, uh, change as speciation occurs uh, throughout evolution of fungi, okay? Hmm. So, but yeah, uh, this is closely related to the European pinophilus. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to look up the sequences of pseudopinophilus from the southeast to see if they're if they're from the same group or not. I'll do that out of interest. Okay. Out of curiosity. All right, Dave. Then you got this one, Voltaceae. Uh, yeah, this one I um, I find in Ricketts Glen, but not very often. I think only two times in the many many years I've been going there. And a few years ago, there were a bunch of them. Um, so I sent some to Igor. Uh, I thought this was Batyri boletus, and I, I thought at first it was Batyri boletus. Uh, there's a species that I had, I think I, I put it here, but it's wrong. Um, sent some to Igor, and he sequenced it. And this mushroom apparently represents a Rosio purpurit. That's wrong, though. Um, this mushroom represents a, a, a genus that doesn't seem to fit in with any of the currently uh, described genera Correct. in the uh, so so this is a pretty interesting mushroom i i wish i found it more often but i did make some pretty good collections um and i think i probably still have some here as well that are, that are dehydrated uh, i should probably send it off to a legitimate herbarium i think i gave i'm pretty sure i, I gave some to njma um to to store if I didn't, I, I will correct that and I'll find it and send some. Um, but it's uh, not particularly bitter. I think I did taste it and it was, um, you know, fairly mild. Uh, I didn't eat any, so I don't know if it's edible. Um, it's It's got the bruising that starts out blue and goes over to uh sort of a brownish when it fades at least on the on the tubes you can see that um it's reticulate stipe uh it's a big hefty uh mushroom when it comes out so hope to find that again at some point in the future and i look for it every year i know the spot where it grows it's a very easy spot to check it's it's really only a maybe less than 100 yards from where where I park my car and it's right right along a um, Dave say the name again somebody's asking I I don't we just know it's a bowl oh, oh, oh. We, we, we don't know where to place it even in what in what genus right so they're calling it bolitaceae so they're just putting it in that family ah. but they're not even they're, at this point we can't even figure out what a genus mm -hmm. if there is a genus so maybe there's yeah. 93 genuses in the world not 92 mm -hmm. <laughs> So hopefully I can find some more and um, maybe study it a little bit more and may maybe get some help from some other people as well. We yeah. should describe this. We should find this again and carefully describe it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I've been looking. This I've should been be published. Looking. This is a very attractive species and we should publish it. Yeah, I think so. I agree. And I, you know, like I said, I just need to maybe find it again. Um, and 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 you're right. Yeah, write a very detailed description. All right, cool. Well, that is everyone. Thank you very much for everyone for sharing. Um, we did run over a few minutes, but I think we did pretty good here. Um, so, like I um, just a reminder, next week our taxonomy Tuesday is just the um, not just, but it is a return to our regular show and tell. So we're just looking for stuff that we found this month ballpark, you know, give or take, um, stuff that we found over the winter. All right, so um, there were a couple of questions. I just wanted to put that out there because I know some people like to get out of here right at nine, have to get up early or whatever. Um, the, I will read through these questions. I think I, um, I think this is the first question that was on here that Marisol mentioned. It said, um, with respect to harvesting etiquette for boletes and to promote future fruiting and not to damage the delicate mycelium, best way to, is to twist and pull or cut. I don't know. I feel like that always opens up a can of worms. <laughs> um, uh, I always, I, I pull them and just trim them on site. Um, I don't know. Does anybody have anything they really want to add to that? 
And mm -hmm. people 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 argue about this for days and weeks. I, and weeks I have and I have been told that when you cut a mushroom off just above at ground level and leave the base of the stipe in the ground, that that actually makes it more likely that the fungus will be infected with some sort of bacteria or something. So it's actually probably the lesser of two evils, if you want to think of it that way, is to uh, pull the entire fruit body up. And, um, and as you said, Luke, if it's an edible, if I know I'm going to eat it and I know what it is, I'll trim it right, right on, you know, in the field. But if it's something I'm try going to try to identify, then I don't, I, I don't clean it up all that much. I'll take the whole thing home and try to get good pictures as well. But that's what I have heard. I've heard that it's actually better to, to, um, to not cut at ground level. There you go. All right. Many, many years ago, there's a study done about chattrells. I know they're not bolites, but they studied it for over 10 years on the um, Mount Hood, uh, the uh, Portland Mushroom Club. And they went to plots that were mapped out on Mount Hood for years and years and years. They found absolutely no difference between cutting, plucking, pulling, whatever, in, in distribution or, or frequency of the mushroom. That's for chanterelles only, though, that they were looking at. Right. So I'm not sure about bolites, but I would suspect it might be the same. Cool. All right. I think that answered everyone's questions, right? Is everyone good? Anybody else have any questions? I didn't see any more in there. All right. Well, then I'm going to... Um, just one last thing. Um, there is a, a lecture this Sunday, Sunday afternoon. I'm getting ready to send the announcement out right now as soon as we get off here. So just watch your what emails. Time, what time? I think it's a four o'clock. Oh, okay. It's, I'm pretty sure it's a four o'clock. Okay. Um, four o'clock. Yes. So I will send that out right now. As soon as we get off here, I'm just going to finish it up and send it out. Thank Good. you. All right. And That's I was awesome. Thanks, awesome. Everybody. Yeah, this was, a, this was a great session, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks everyone for sharing and everybody. see Thank you guys you. next week. Good night. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night.